Uh, it's a real honor to um, kick off this uh, wonderful conference at this beautiful venue. Um, given that the theme of the conference is our enemy, the state, I'm going to start off by talking about the greatest friends of the state besides lawyers. Um, hence the title, Economists and the State, From Enemies to Friends. Um, so economists and the state are natural enemies. The central principle of economics is that the means for improving human welfare, what we call goods, are naturally scarce and must be produced before they can be used to satisfy human wants. The scarcity principle also implies that once produced, the bar bestowing of goods on one person cannot occur without depriving some other person or persons of their use. In other words, there's no such thing as a, the, as a free lunch. The state and its friends reject the scarcity principle and uphold its polar opposite, the Santa Claus principle, which Mises is defined as, and I'm quoting, the idea that the government or the state is an entity outside and above the social process of production, that it owns something which is not derived from taking it, sub, taking it from its subjects, and that it can spend this mythical something for definite purposes, unquote. 100 years before Mises wrote this, the French liberal and laissez-faire economist Frédéric Bastiat exposed the Santa Claus fable underlying all arguments for state intervention into the economy and emphatically affirmed the scarcity principle. It's worth quoting Bastiat's argument at length. Bastiat says, um, here the public on the one side, the state on the other, are considered as two distinct entities, the latter intent upon pouring down on the former uh, a veritable shower of human felicities, that is, goodies. The fact is that the state does not and cannot have one hand only. It has two hands, one to take and the other to give. Strictly speaking, the state can take and not give because its hands always retain a part and sometimes the whole of what they take. But what has never been seen, what will never be seen, and cannot even be conceived, is the state giving the public more than it has taken from it. It is fundamentally impossible for it to confer a particular advantage on some individuals who constitute the community without inflicting a greater damage on the entire community. Based on this reasoning, Bastiat formulated his justly famous definition of the state, and I quote, the state is the great fictitious entity by which everyone seeks to live at the expense of everyone else. Bastia also foresaw that once the Santa Claus view of the state is widely accepted by the public, the state will be able to grow without limit. The reason, according to Bastia, is that the state is composed of, I'm quoting, cabinet ministers, of bureaucrats, of men in short, who like all men, carry in their hearts the desire and always enthusiastically seize the opportunity to see their wealth and influence grow. The state understands then, very quickly, the use it can make of the role the public entrusts to it. It will be the arbiter, the master of all destinies. It will take a great deal, hence a great deal will remain for itself. It will multiply the number of its agents. It will enlarge the scope of its prerogatives. It will end by acquiring overwhelming proportions. And that's pretty prescient. I mean, that's what we have today with, with the US superstate. Um, Prior to World War I, economists as a group were hated and denounced by statists of all stripes, monarchists, socialists, nationalists, theocrats, democrats. Um, because economists exploded the Santa Claus myth and exposed the state for what it really is, a predatory organization whose every action benefits itself and its cronies by victimizing those who earn their income by voluntarily producing and exchanging goods. In 1949, Mises emphasized the historical enmity between economists and the state. Quoting Mises, it is impossible to understand the history of economic thought if one does not pay attention to the fact that economics as such is a challenge to the conceit of those in power. An economist can never be a favorite of autocrats and demag demagogues. With them, he is always the mischief maker. And the more they are inwardly convinced that his objectives are well found, objections are well founded, the more they hate him, unquote. Unfortunately, at about the time that Mises wrote this, the relationship between economists and the state was already beginning to undergo radical change. This was most clearly manifested in the publication in 1948 of the first edition of Paul Samuelson's celebrated textbook, Economics and Introductory Analysis. In this book, 
Samuelson concocted what has come to be called the neoclassical synthesis, which was a vain attempt to combine the scarcity principle with the Santa Claus principle. The movement to incorporate the Santa Claus principle into economics was propelled by theoretical developments uh, in economics during the 1930s. On the one hand, Lionel Robbins, who was a, a, a former follower of Mises, um, his famous book, An Essay on the Nature and Significance of Economic Science, impressed on, on, on most of the economics profession that scarcity and not material wealth is the central theme of economic theory. But on the other hand, several developments in other areas of economics at about the same time persuaded economists that markets were imperfect and often failed to deliver the goods at the lowest cost in the proper combination and at a level consistent with the full employment of resources. So there were basically three revolutions in economics that was a, were a revolution against the scarcity principle. <clears throat> Let us briefly consider the, the, these theories of market failure. The monopolistic competition revolution, which began in 1933, promoted the view that most markets in the economy are monopolistic. Brand names, locational differences, trademarks, and variations in product composition and packaging mislead consumers to differentiate between similar or the same products. This gives almost every firm a monopolistic niche and endows it with the market power to raise its price above the perfectly competitive price, uh, which to economists means the price that would exist in a never-never land where all sellers and buyers possess perfect knowledge, all firms are infinitesimally small, and goods in every market are completely identical. I mean, it's a total ridiculous. Um, monopolistic competition thus results in firms inefficiently restricting the production of goods to achieve a higher price, while incurring higher production costs and excess capacity. So inefficiency. Um, the 1930s also saw the continued development of welfare economics, which emerged as a formal subdiscipline in 1920 with the publication of the Economics of Welfare by a British economist, and some people say a Soviet agent, um, A.C. Pigou. Pigou emphasized the concepts of external benefits and external costs. These concepts still play a central role in, in welfare economics and refer to the fact that individuals do not always reap all the benefits or bear all the costs of their market activities. And that's a common sense insight. In the case of external benefits, according to these economists, this leads to market failure in the form of underinvestment in goods like education, lighthouses, and basic scientific research. An educated voter or a lighthouse yields benefits to third parties who do not pay for its production or, or consumption. And thus, less of the good is produced than would be the case if the producers of the good and their paying customers captured all the benefit. The market failure argument that was most influential in entrenching the Santa Claus myth in modern economics was contrived by John Maynard Keynes in his book, The General Theory, published in 1936. Yeah. There, Keynes argued that the market economy generally fails to generate sufficient total spending, or what he called aggregate demand, to purchase the entire output that the economy could potentially produce when its labor force and other resources are fully employed. This implies that resources are in general superabundant and that scarcity exists only in what Keynes called the special case, where consumers and entrepreneurs fortuitously spend just enough to purchase the full employment level of output. However, if superabundance of resources is a general case, then the Santa Claus principle takes central stage, center stage in, in economics. Government expenditure financed by money creation does not deprive anyone of part of his real income, but miraculously conjures into existence extra goodies that can be bestowed on some without taking from others. Um, in the early years of the Keynesian Revolution, uh, Abba Lerner, a radical Keynesian and, and the, God, the grandfather uh, uh, of, so, of the so-called modern monetary theory, which you might hear more about today or tomorrow, attempted to justify the Santa Claus principle in scientific terms. He called the economic theory that applied to a world of excess resources topsy-turvy economics and contrasted it with ordinary economics based on the scarcity principle. Without completely rejecting the latter, the scarcity principle, he wrote, quote, an economy suffering from unemployment is an upside-down economy. 
for that which only a topsy-turvy economic theory is of any use. So you can say crazy things, and it would be right because the economy is upside down. Ordinary or right-side-up economics is concerned with the economical use of resources. The resources are scarce. It is important to economize, to use less of any resource for the performance of any task. But then he goes on. But when there is unemployment, this is no longer the case. There is no point to carry out some task with less labor if there are unemployed workers available because the workers set free would merely be added to the unemployment. So for Lerner, improving economic efficiency only increases unemployment. You, you use fewer, in the, uh, less labor to do the same things and makes things worse in Keynes's upside down economy. So does thrift. According to Lerner, in our upside down economy which suffers from unemployment, thrift merely reduces the demand for products and the resources which have gone into making them are merely left unused and are wasted. So according to Lerner, and I'm quoting him here, the same considerations apply in reverse, too. Just as efficiency and thrift lead to suffering and impoverishment, so do inefficiency and prodigality bring relief, relief and enrichment. So Lerner actually argued that monopolistic restriction, wasteful work rules imposed by unions, tariffs, Anything and everything that causes inefficiency and waste um, increases unemployment in the upside-down economy. Now, Lerner gives a condescending praise to Henry Hazlitt's magnificent expose of basic economic fallacies. According to Lerner, quote, one of the finest attacks on topsy-turvy economics is to be found in Henry Hazlitt's book, Economics in One Lesson. Mr. Hazlitt is able to tear to little pieces a large number of propositions of the kind put, I put forward in this chapter, because all his argument is based on the assumption, mostly unconscious, of a state of full employment in which topsy-turvy economics is completely out of place. Perhaps he will one day consider the possibility of an economy suffering from unemployment and write the second lesson. Okay, this is total nonsense. He does consider unemployment in his book. The great Hazlitt never took Lerner up on his suggestion, perhaps because he was conscious that in the real world, the free market economy is right side up, resources are always scarce, and the state is not the incarnation of Santa Claus myth, but a descendant of the very real Attila the Hun. Compared to Lerner, contemporary mainstream economists are much more temperate in their rhetoric. However, their theoretical position does not essentially differ from Lerner's. While paying lip service to scarcity, they still firmly hold to the main principle of topsy-turvy economics, that the state is able to provide something for nothing. All current economics textbooks teach that the state increases the supply of goods and improves human welfare by curing market failures such as externalities, external costs and benefits, monopoly, and the ever-present tendency toward a deficiency of total spending. But all that modern mainstream economics really does is cloak the Santa Claus fable in scientific terminology. The only resources that the state has at its disposal are those that ha have already been produced on the market uh, and then coercively siphoned off from the producers by taxation and inflation. This reduces the welfare of productive workers and capitalist entrepreneurs to the benefits of parasitic politicians, bureaucrats, government contractors, financial elites, and the state's favored victims groups. Aside from the direct seizure of their income by taxation and inflation, productive taxpayers suffer from further reduction in their wealth and welfare by a host of additional state interventions into the economy, such as regulations, tariffs, antitrust laws, price controls, and state-granted monopoly privileges. The theory of, monop of market failure is thus a rhetorical device used to conceal the fact that modern welfare economics is based squarely on the Santa Claus principle, that the state is an entity existing apart from society and possessing a mysterious fount of resources that it can freely shower on selected individuals and groups without imposing deprivation on other individuals and groups. Austrian economic economists, particularly Mises and Rothbard, have demolished all market failure arguments and with them the case for the welfare state. They have demonstrated that monopolistic restriction of production cannot arise on an unhampered market, that external benefits are a blessing to society, that when people do things that other, benefit other people, that, that's to be applauded. It's great. Um, and do not cause an underproduction of vital goods. 
and that any supply of money is sufficient to facilitate the exchange of the entire output of goods produced in a fully employed economy. Once it is affirmed that economics is all about and only about human action in a world of pervasive and unremitting scarcity, it becomes crystal clear that the proponents of welfare economics, topsy-turvy economics, the modern monetary theory, and their ilk are not economists at all. They are anti-economists who fail to grasp that capital goods, the indispensable foundation blocks of civilized human existence, are scarce and perishable and must be economized, replaced, and accumulated to maintain and improve living standards for everyone. And the only way that can be done is through saving and thrift. But confiscatory taxation, chronic inflation, and, ma and many other uh, interventions uh, that constitute the, the welfare state discourage saving and cause capital consumption, declining living standards, and an accelerating process of decivilization. The importation of the Santa Claus myth into economics is not only absurd, therefore, but economically and socially destructive. Mises recognized and vigorously criticized the, other, the utter failure of the welfare doctrinaires to, com to comprehend the nature and function of capital. Quoting Mises, the Santa Claus fables of the welfare school are characterized by their complete failure to grasp the problems of capital. It is precisely this defect which makes it imperative to deny them the appellation welfare economics with which they describe their doctrines. Hugh does not take into account or into consideration the scarcity of capital goods available is not an economist but a fabulist. He does not deal with reality but with a fabulous world of plenty. All effusions of the contemporary welfare school are based on the implicit assumption that there is an abundant supply of capital goods. So to conclude, um, it was the smuggling of the Santa Claus principle into economics under the cover of welfare economics and the topsy-turvy economics of Keynes that transformed the economists and the state from bitter enemies into the best of friends. Since World War II, it has been a relationship of great mutual benefit. The state receives a scientific imprimatur and on every conceivable kind of intervention, and the economics profession receives extravagant government research grants to study and lucrative positions in the federal bureaucracy to administer these destructive interventionist schemes that eat up capital and, de and, and cause us all decivilization. As Mises perceptively noted after World War II, the development of a profession of economists is an offshoot of interventionism. The professional economist is a specialist who is instrumental in designing various measures of government interference with business. He is an expert in the field of economic legislation, which today invariably aims at hindering the operation of the unhampered market economy. It often happens that such experts are called to direct the affairs of big banks and corporations, are elected into the legislature, and are appointed as cabinet ministers. They rival the legal profession in the supreme conduct of political affairs. The eminent role they play in one of the most, is one of the most characteristic features of our age of interventionism. Now, since Mises wrote this in 1949, the economics profession has gone from friends and wartime consigliaries of the state to an integral part of the state apparatus. They infest almost every federal bureaucracy from the Fed, Treasury, and Department of Homeland Security to the alphabet soup of federal agencies, including the FDA, the DEA, the FTC, and the CIA. Economists also serve as advisors to both houses of Congress and aides to individual senators and representatives. According to the Brookings Institution, which is not a conservative institution, the federal government employs 2,200 economists. To my knowledge, two PhD economists have even been elected to, to the Senate. Fortunately, so far, as we have been, so far we have been spared um, economists achieving elected office in the White House. The reason is summed up in, uh, the reason is, is simple and summed up in the old joke. An economist is an accountant without the personality. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>